Hello, and welcome to Visual Radio Television, and my guest today, Raymond T. McNally. Hello, Ray. How are you, Joe? I'm great. How about you? I'm fine. Good. Another great book you have out. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. I'm enjoying it right now. I'm in the middle of it. In search of Dr. Jekyll and Miss Dr. Jekyll. Right. <laughs> I'm glad I did that. Yeah, now you can explain, please. Well, I've been saying Dr. Jekyll all my life. Yeah, and I think it's because of Heckle and Jekyll, or the idea of heckle, heckling and all that. Whereas Stevenson himself said in two interviews in San Francisco when he was here in this country, it is to be pronounced Jekyll. Long, it's a long E, as in his own name, Stevenson. We don't say Stephenson, mm -hmm. Stevenson, E. He lived a long time in southern France, Robert Louis Stevenson. So it's a play on words. Je kill, I kill and hide, which is what happens in the novel. He kills and hides. So, oh, wow, that's, yeah. that's brilliant. So if you think it's a stretch, also in the book, he has one character say, if he will be Mr. Hyde, I will be Mr. Seek. So he hide and seek, you know, the kids game. So he played on a lot of those. He games. dropped enough hints. Yes, a lot of clues. There's so much to cover, Ray, and we have an hour. Um, we should dig right in. Okay. Jico and Hyde. Comparing it to Dracula, Dracula is a wealth of vampire lore, if you will. Right. But Jekyll and Hyde is just so contained. That's correct. I mean, it, it doesn't go back to folklore. Many people erroneously think so. But it, it, of course, it goes back to an old idea of man into beast form, which mm -hmm. is, is in a lot of shape shifting among the American Indians. It's in a lot of cultures. But the creation of the character we know as Jekyll and Hyde was just that coming from Robert Louis Stevenson and his experiences in Edinburgh as a child. What made you and your co-author pick this as opposed to saying The Life of Lon Chaney and, and The Wolfman? Well, I just stumbled across this prototype, this William Deacon Brody, who was a respectable citizen during the day and a criminal at night. He was a fascinating character. And Robert Louis Stevenson was interested in him as a child, at, already at age 14. Robert Louis Stevenson, who came from Edinburgh, wrote about this guy, William Deacon Brody, who was an 18th century personality, who was a burglar at night and a, one of these respectable people. The novel, though few people pay attention, is, according to Stevenson himself, about hypocrisy. That's what it's about. You see, he lived in Edinburgh, which was Calvinist country, okay. where you had to be, you know, looking pure and upright and all that. But underneath there were a lot of people who were doing a lot of terrible things, and that's what he thought. He thought there were a lot of characters like Jekyll and Hyde walking down the streets of Edinburgh in his own day. So he wanted to write about this double life. He himself led a kind of double life. As a young person, he was in the better part of town, but he loved to frequent the whores and taverns in the lower part of town. He admitted it. Hmm. So he led this double life, a double existence, two persons in one person. It's a fascinating idea, actually. Some people, you know, think there was Jico as a person and then Hyde. Ah, but the stab of the story is a mystery, a strange case. Two persons, two authentic persons in one person. Neither one of them is, you know, the true person, but both are true, and both are real, so authentic. It's a hint of a biography in there. Yes. And oh, yeah, definitely, about, about himself. There's a lot about himself in there. And he did that on purpose? I think so, yeah. Wow. And it started when he was a kid already. He wrote this essay about William Deacon Brody called A Double Life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so double, the double. Came back to the theme again, tried writing a play about it, that didn't go anywhere. Then he had a nightmare in the year 1885 when he was at Bournemouth in England trying to recover. He was a sickly guy almost all his life, tuberculosis, stuff like that. Anyway, he had this nightmare, and this inspired the story. His wife woke him up and he was really upset. He said, I was dreaming a good boogie tale, a boogeyman about a boogeyman. And then he sat down and at a furious pace for three, four days he wrote this thing just off the, sort of off the top of his head from inside himself. And it became an instant bestseller. 
You talk about the subconscious in, in your books. Yes. He tapped into the subconscious and got himself the book that launched his career, really. That's right. Up until then, he, he said himself, I am read by critics, young boys, and other authors. <laughs> I mean, he had been kidnapped in Treasure Island. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. Right. It's read by children. He had never done anything that was important uh, or that sold anything anywhere in for adults. And this one was the one that really launched his career. Overnight, he was able to live off his writing. Now, we tend to think there are a lot of people that do that. But if you look back, you probably know this, Joe. There are very few people, even today. Oh, Stephen sure. King, you know, Isaac Asimov, late Isaac Asimov. Uh, you know, they are able to do it, but, but not many people. And in his day, very few. And he lived just from his writings. He didn't do anything else. And this was the one that did it. Interesting. This one made him the big bucks, so he was able to then do come to America and then eventually to the South Seas where the climate was a little better than Scotland for him. He had, you know, he had a tough time living in his, he loved his hometown, Edinburgh and all that, but the weather there is very, very difficult for, especially for someone as weak as he was. He was, from childhood on, he was a sickly person. Now, as Edgar Allan Poe's writings sold after his death, yeah. do you think Treasure Island and Kidnapped would be the classics we know them today without Jekyll and Hyde? I think so. For children's literature, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's still just, they stand on their own. Yes. But, uh, no, I don't think that fed in in that case, because it's separate genre, you know. I mean, children's literature is one thing. And that was really, really well written. But, uh, you know, it's something else to write for an adult audience, and this was his first breakthrough. He was very proud of it. And, and he, long before Freud, you know. I mean, Freud... This is 1886 when this was published. Freud's stuff doesn't begin even to come out until then. Hmm. So he anticipates a lot of what became, you know, standard stuff about the struggle that can go on inside a person where there are two persons at war. The war among the members, he called it. Each one striving to take over, in this case, Jiko, who is frankly rather boring as a person. He's a He's n there are a lot of myths about this, of course. He's not a medical doctor, okay? And not a practicing one. He has a degree in medicine. He has a degree in a lot of things. He's a chemical researcher. It's quite different. He doesn't run a clinic for, for poor patients, the way you see it in the movies, you know, to make him sympathetic. Uh-uh. He's a recluse. But that's the artistic license of Hollywood. They oh. shape things and... Well, they sure do. In almost invariably, with a very few exceptions, they get a hold of a story and they think they can make it better. Now, here's the way I look at it. I think it is true, of course, what works in a novel doesn't work in a movie, often, and vice versa. I understand that. You cannot, and I've, I have examples, and you probably know them too, Joe, about people who put a novel on film. Well, that's stupid, you know. I mean, you can't put a novel on film. Not really. First of all, novels often have to do with uh, human thought. Mm -hmm. It's extremely difficult to put human thought on film. Film is usually about action, people moving around, doing something. So there are two different genres. So only thing I expect from a filmmaker is that hopefully he or she will remain faithful to the spirit of the story. And this is the big problem. Often they fool around so much with the story that you lose what the author had in mind. In this case, instead of the emphasis on hypocrisy, which is what was in Stevenson's mind, he said so himself, they turn it into a sex story, you know, with Hyde being a juggernaut, sexual juggernaut. He's not a sexual juggernaut. In fact, Stevenson himself, he's no more sexual than anybody else. Sure, he's sexual. So who isn't? But that isn't what this is all about. This is about the hypocrisy hmm. of Jiko, who allows and indeed enjoys in the beginning the dark side. He's happy when Hyde emerges. With a leap of joy, I greeted Hyde, my other being. Because it, it's like, well, in the Freudian terms, it's the repression, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the release. 
And of course, what happens in the story is typical Freudianism. The more he represses, Hyde, the more Hyde comes out and takes over. In fact, it's at those moments when Jekyll is at rest and thinks, you know, he's in control with his ego and all that stuff. It's at those precise moments that the Hyde within him emerges and uh -huh. eventually overpowers the other person in the end. By the end, Dr. Jekyll, in effect, this is scary, no longer exists. He has ceased to be. Maybe he never was. In a way, you're right, because he never was in the, you know, he, never, he, was, he was and never was from the beginning, frankly. He's not interesting, Dr. Chico. He's 50-ish, he's a bachelor. By the way, that's another thing, if I may. They're all bachelors in this story, every last one of them. Chico's a bachelor, all his buddies are bachelors. I was going to ask you if Stevenson was a uh, repressed homosexual. Oh, I have no idea. I'm not an expert in psychiatric treatment or something. I think he had a, he needed a nurse all his life, a kind huh. of mother. He had it first in a nanny who took right. care of him because he needed to be taken care of. He was very sickly. And then he married this woman and who was 10 years older than he. Hmm. And I think she was just the kind of, in my opinion, I'm no expert though on such matters, but kind of mother figure. She was not, took, they didn't have any children, you know, she took care of him and all that. So definitely the atmosphere in that novel lends itself to what we would call today homosexuality, whether active or not is questionable, but certainly these guys all hang out together. Chico has no fiancé. Hmm. And everybody thinks so because in the movies and in the theater, he's always given a fiancé. He has no fiancé. No. None. And as far as Hyde is concerned, he has no music hall performer, you know, prostitute to hang out with, which is in the movies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so they all domesticate the character. And maybe you have to, I'm, again... For know, Hollywood or... For Hollywood, to make it sellable. You know, after all, although I would think today a movie with all guys might go. But, well, in the past, maybe not, you know, because where's the, let's call it, traditional love interest? Right. There isn't one in, the, in that story, unless it's between Jekyll and Hyde, which is weird, I mean, Chico loves Hyde, let's face it, and is fascinated with him because Hyde does the stuff that Chico would love to do, can't, because he's inhibited. So, but that's a case of like Narcissus, you know, in love with yourself or something. And I can see in a movie that might not, well, maybe today it might go, but certainly in the past it wouldn't go. So, began in the theater with a guy, a local guy from Boston, actually, Robert Thomas Sullivan. Hmm or excuse me, Thomas Russell Sullivan. He's the one who made the first theatrical adaptation of the story. And he added the female characters. Fiancé for Jigo, prostitute for in Soho for Hyde. Maybe the book made him nervous. <laughs> he was another bachelor guy. Wow. Lived until 50, until then he finally married. You know, well. Well, the quintessential dual life, uh, Hide and seek kind of thing is yeah. is uh, Rock Hudson. Who knew? Yeah. No Raymond Burr. Who knew? Yes, exactly. I was I was flabbergasted when, especially with Burr. Raymond Burr. I mean, kind of a tough guy. You know? Barbara Hale's birthday was like the other day. She's still on TV. He was not gay. You know. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> and all this land and money he left to Robert Benavides. You know, yeah. she just kind of um, he was a good friend or whatever. <laughs> I mean, you can still be gay and a good friend. <laughs> I mean, what's wrong with it? I mean, the guy just has a fixation. Barbara Hale, for some reason, wants to carry on the legacy once. What do you know? It's fascinating. Yes. You know? It'd be interesting to find out why she feels so strongly that way, you know? Well, I think maybe she really did have feelings for Raymond Burr, as they portray in the films. Uh-huh. I mean, I love that Perry Mason stuff, oh, and it's yeah. very the much... The connection is beautiful. I mean, they yeah. have something going there, definitely. Yeah. Wait, you are so film oriented. Yeah, I, I don't have to tell you that. Horror films, especially. But you go beyond the horror films. You really go to the hardcore origins of all this material. Yeah. You're the perfect consultant for a movie to really make a movie a 
classic movie. Have you thought of this being a guidepost? Well, thank you, Joe. I mean, it's nice to hear those words, but uh, yes, I know, but I don't know whether they would want to know what I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a producer might say, ah, that's all very nice, but we've got to make a story that'll sell here and we don't have to be too accurate about a bunch of this stuff and of course my problem is I'm a historian and I I don't even invent the weather when I write a book you know right I go to the source and I go to the data and I would assume a filmmaker well I've had some dealing with a filmmaker he's adhered more or less to stuff I did but most of the other, and yeah, and there are options on this book. And uh, oh, really? Yeah. So oh, cool. Maybe someday, but we'll we'll just have to see. But this is such a uh, comprehensive work because you've got the film. You go through the whole. I mean, I saw stuff in here that, as a horror film fan, I knew nothing about. Oh, good. I mean, you really Important. you cover <laughs> the bases, Ray, yeah. and, and it, it's just amazing. And then you, after you describe it, you have back here. Uh, always wonderful, the chronology. Yeah, so you can, and what's going on at the same time, it's important. Most of us, including myself, don't really remember that at the same time this is going on, something else is happening. And the two illuminate one another and help you to grasp what's going on, like, you know, Darwin's Origin of Species, 1869, and mm -hmm. all that. that created a big sensation. And, of course, that's part of the background to this story this notion of the human being coming from the beast form through the evolutionary process and then of course what's called atavism meaning simply return why not hmm. we came from beasts why not a return and that's what happened to the return to the beast form which is shocking to most people especially those i would say of calvinist background you know that we are humans we are above animals and beasts and all that sort of stuff well uh, Here's a case where the guy reverts, really, back to the beast-like form. In fact, Stevenson wrote another story called The Suicide Club, a really great story, in which one guy is going to commit suicide because he cannot live with the notion of being descended from an ape, from hmm. apes, from, from beasts. From I'm sure it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me, but in the Victorian period it bothered a lot of people. You know, we are humans, we are different. You know, this notion that possibility of this subterranean dark side r emerging, scary. And so much so that they repressed it often, said, no, 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 we, we don't want anything to do with it. For example, I mean, there are some absurd examples. In the Victorian period, they would clothe piano legs. It's true. What? Yes. Why? Because when you walk into a room, and you see a naked piano leg, whoa, you could get turned on sexually. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> and that's, that's a little too far out there that's for me. That's pretty far out. <laughs> but that was the sort of thing, you know. And you didn't talk about people's arms, limbs, especially women who had limbs like a tree. You didn't refer to the anatomy of people very much in the Victorian period. You used circumlocution and stuff like that. But without all this repression, we wouldn't have a lot of great literature, it's sad to say. That is true. That's very true. Frankenstein, right? Yes. A lot of it comes from repressed feelings that then spill out, as in this case, in a story. You know, here's the funny thing, reading your book, Ray, having grown up on Frankenstein, Dracula, all the Hammer films, of course, oh, yes. and, uh, and the Universal films. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget, I never went back and looked at where they were in history, and I never realized Jekyll and Hyde was 10 years prior to Dracula. Yes, that's uh, right. One that wouldn't, it wouldn't even, yeah. when you watch the two movies, yeah. come to mind. 1920, so with John Barrymore, you know, the great profile. I mean, it was a good movie for, for that period. But there this were ones before that, too, as you know, 1908, 1909, short ones. But the big one was 1920. And then 1932 with Mamoulian, Ruben Mamoulian, what a wonderful movie. With Frederick March played Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and won an Academy Award. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You'll appreciate this, Joe. It was the only time that an actor who starred in a horror movie won an Academy Award until Anthony Hopkins 
silence of the Lord. Can you believe it? Peter Lorre never won one. Boris Karloff never won one. You can go on and on with all those guys. But Frederick March wasn't typecast as Karloff and Lugosi were, was he? That's correct, he was But you know, Karloff wasn't typecast. I mean, Lugosi was typecast, of course. Mm -hmm. But that was Lugosi's problem, in my opinion. Because mm -hmm. he never bothered to learn proper English. He came from you know, the town of Lugosi in, in, in the Banat region. Same place, by the way, pe most people don't know this. The same area from which Edward G. Robinson came? Yes, the Carpathian Mountains. Peter Lorre? Really? Yeah. You wouldn't know that, would you? I, I never knew that. I thought, Edward G. Robinson, he's got to be American. I mean, he, I watch these films. I don't go back and... Uh, you, the people just don't go back and, and find out where they, the actors came from. Yeah, and Peter Lorre's another one. You'd wow. But anyway, Lugosi learned his lines phonetically. Can you believe it? It's true. So in the 1931 movie, he often didn't know what he was saying exactly. Even though he had said those lines, what, a thousand times or more sure. on stage? He, on the, since 1927, he was on stage doing that thing. But it was phonetic. So, but see, oh, that, wow. that allows the weirdness of the expression, sure. for example. He labors with these words, which you and I, you know, for example, he says, good night. Mr. Renfield, because he's laboring with the word. You and I would say, good night, Mr. Renfield. It's a throwaway line. But for him, he's got in his brain, uh, how did that sound? <coughs> and so, <coughs> in my opinion, he deserved to be typecast. I don't feel any sympathy for him. Because he did, did not learn English, and he used to criticize Peter Laurie and Edward G. Robinson for learning English. He said, why do you learn English? I didn't learn English, and I'm a main actor. But you see, yeah, he was a main actor, but every role he played, he was Dracula. But no matter what they said, he, he sounded like Dracula, you know. Laboring over the words well, was so important to the success of the film. Exactly. That's the strangeness of it. I mean... You can shut your eyes, and it's still very alive. Yes. And that's why schoolboys and schoolgirls, even today, can you know, do an imitation of Bela Lugosi because it was just, it's just a strange way to speak. I it's am. English, all right, but <laughs> strange kind of English. Dracula. Dracula. <laughs> the reminds me of the twisted battlements of my castle in Transylvania. <laughs> oh, how wonderful it must be to be really dead. That must be glorious. <laughs> great stuff. Right. Great, great Frederick stuff. March did a good job. And, and that movie by Mamoulian in the same, the 30s, yeah. That's Page 138, movie. folks. It's a great picture <laughs> yeah. with a, a toast, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. About well, to drink the potion. Bush, uh, this guy, Mamoulian, is an interesting guy who did, was the director. He came from Tbilisi, Tiflis, in Georgia. Not Georgia, Georgia, but Georgia, you know, in the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And he directed operas. Ah. So he had a touch, and he directed that movie. It was a very, very fine movie with a lot of symbols and, you know, really artistic sort of movie. And again, Mark, Frederick March won an Academy Award. That was, that was incredible for that time period. Now, like the movies, um, the book Dracula was influenced by Jekyll and Hyde? Or do you think, it seems that, uh, I thought it was hinted at in here. Uh, when you said the cold hand... Yeah, there are similarities, but I think it's more or less the similarity of the Gothic style. Okay. Oh, so you don't think Bram Stoker read... Oh, I'm sure he did. Uh, ah. He read Chico and Hyde, but his story... Th there are other... I wouldn't say that Dracula was a, a case of two persons in one, the way, you know, Chico and Hyde. But the mystery of it all, and that whole side, sure. I mean, the Gothic atmosphere. Ten years before Dracula. Now, in search of Dracula, was that your first book? The first popular book on the subject, yeah, 1972, quite a while back. Right. That's we met around 76, I yeah, think. 76. And um, how did this come about? How did you get published uh, with this project? Well, first of all, you hear about stories being inspired by nightmares and things. I was watching the Late Late Show back in the 50s. All right. And they revived those old mm -hmm. universal horrors, including Dracula and all that. And I had an intuition. 
Transylvania, Bystrica, real places. Not made up. Geography is correct. Hey, maybe there's something to the character. Now you might say, well, why didn't anybody think about that? Well, nobody did, because they said it's a vampire story. It's all made up by this Irish author, Bram Stoker. I didn't think so. And I started investigating, because it was all too detailed, especially about the character, this Vlad character who fought against the Turks and all that. So then I got a Fulbright Research Fellowship, believe it or not, to go over to Romania in 1969 and to investigate all this stuff. So I always had this vision of some senator send, standing up, you know, and saying, <laughs> what are we doing with our <laughs> research? Transylvania? But I don't feel badly because government money has been spent on worse things than vampires, right, Joe? Well, yeah, but this is important work. Uh, From a literary level, this is important work. Yeah. And on, a, on an artistic level, too. this is important work. Yeah. It's fun for me, and I think for other people, obviously, because that was a bestseller, that to find out that something you thought was made up, wholly coming from somebody's imagination, was not wholly made up. And in fact, aside from the connection between Vlad and Transylvanian folklore, ironically, Bram Stoker didn't make up anything. The garlic, the cross, it's all authentic folklore from Transylvania. He read about it in a book by Emily Girard about Transylvania superstition. He just incorporated that all into the novel. So I find it enriches the reading of something if you say, hey, this, now we know this is based on somebody who was actually real, who existed. Of course it's poetic, it's fiction. It's mm -hmm. not history. It's not the guy who lived once, but it's inspired by that. And if you look at it, it's fun, at an encyclopedia before 1972, under the Dracula rubric, you'll see an imaginary character <laughs> made up by Bram Stoker, blah, 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 blah. After 72, all the encyclopedias changed and referred to Vlad the Impaler as the source for it. Because of this? Yes, because of that. That's incredible. So you impacted the dictionaries. Yeah. And Dracula was the word, the name he used, this ruler from Romania. He didn't call himself the Impaler. You've got to be kidding. Your enemies can call you Impaler, right? Right. If I come and meet you and I say, hi, Joe, and I say to you, hi, I'm Vlad the Impaler. What's your name? <laughs> I'm out of here. You're out of here, right. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly. So say Dracula, and Dracula was the order of the dragon, that's all. Fascinating. Not from the Holy Roman Emperor King Sigismund at Nuremberg in the year 1431. It's the order of the dragon. Dracula is the order of, son of the one who has the order of the dragon. That's what that meant in his day. You make history fun. Well, I, I, I hope so. I mean, if it's, I take the attitude, it's fun for me, and I hope some of that is imparted to the students. Oh, sure. The old pictures, just the, uh, the way you tell the stories, retell them. It, it's fascinating. You've done In Search of Dracula, In Search of Frankenstein, In Search of Jekyll and Hyde. We did In Search of Ray McNally today on the internet. <laughs> um, Ray McNally, have you ever seen a 25-year old autograph of yours? Wow, terrific. A fellow Dracula hunter to Joe. Great. But that's, uh, we've been In Search of Ray McNally and uh, <laughs> we did an interview two and a half decades ago, or maybe yes. longer. Yes. And there's your autograph from way back when. Amazing. It's, it, it, it came through the ages. Keep that, Joe. When I'm dead, it'll be worth something. Oh, it's worth something right now. Stop <laughs> it. Uh, anyways, uh, you'll be around for a long, long time because we'll see. I think you you really are a vampire. You do? I'm an undead. Uh, huh? I think you could star in a movie. I think you'd be good as the, uh, yeah. maybe as a uh, Van Helsing. I'd love to play Van Helsing. Actually, see, it's a see that? Of mine. Really? Yes. See, I'm psychic. Yeah, Van Helsing, I could do. It's you know, the wise old guy who knows the folklore and he knows the history too. He he knows he's not just into the occult, you know. He knows other stuff too, and he makes this tremendous statement, in my opinion, uh -huh. you know, the superstitions of yesterday become the scientific truths of today. Wow. I don't re recall that one. That's great. If you think about it, you know, many of the great discoveries came from, almost all of them, in my field history and in the natural sciences, 
from someone thinking the impossible. Yes, think of Darwin or any of them. The impossible. When you start out, you say something and people say, oh, that can't be. As in this case, you know, oh, no, 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 that's impossible. In my opinion, if they tell, if anybody tells you that, you know you're on the right track <laughs> most of the time because it's the impossible that brings the breakthrough in right. history and natural science. Thinking the unthinkable. Henry Ford. Thinking in terms of squares, circles, they don't exist, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no such thing as a perfect square or perfect circle. But thinking like that, ah, that can allow you then to open up a whole new vista. Hmm. Feed in then with the natural phenomena, you know, the two going together, the theory and the practice. So, didn't Einstein say imagination was one of our most important gifts? Something like that. Said that. And probably, I think it's true. And to imagine the ima unimaginable, that which other people think cannot be, that's where the breakthroughs come. You know, like space is curved. <laughs> Einstein or E equals MC squared. Who would think that? What are we talking about? I mean, that's not possible. But it is possible. Our time travel, which I can't comprehend. Well, I don't understand it much either. But, you know, I could talk to you for three or four hours just on the books, but I like to throw questions at our guests. Who's the most interesting person who came up to you about the book that really stunned you? I think the most interesting person because of my connection with that book, was Vincent Price. Really? Yes. And ex as you might suspect, the image that he projected, in his case, was true. He was a real gentleman. And I was on a show with him, a TV show in New York City, and we had a wine tasting at the end of the show. And several years later, I was called out to L.A. to be in something called the Horror Hall of Fame, and he was the host of that show. Wow. He walked up to me and said, Hi, Raymond. Last time we met was under more auspicious circumstances. He remembered about the wine tasting after the show. I thought, you know, hundreds of people must meet this guy. And he was sharp enough to remember. Yeah, but your work, I'm sure it impressed him. Had to. Yeah. He seemed so genuine. Vincent. Yeah, he was a real genuine person. They had him say a lot of silly lines often in many, many movies. These afternoon naps are so refreshing. <laughs> he played a kind of a vampire. But those... <laughs> somebody, some guy was there named Igor, you know, biting at his foot. He said, Igor, he was born with a silver tooth in his mouth. <laughs> so he had a sense of humor, all right. But I like those Roger Corman movies. They kind of stand yes. as, as quickie movies. They were great. Oh, they were great. I met Roger Corman, too, you know, down at a fantasy convention. Another gentleman, similar to Vincent Price. Very well educated. Huh. And he wrote a book, I think I'm paraphrasing the title. I brought it in always 10 cents below cost or something. I Maybe you remember that. He always brought the movies, you know, how many movies drag out and they cost. James Cameron, out. sure. Cleopatra. No. I mean, he brought it in under budget always. I mean, he could he could produce, and st he's still active today. He doesn't do much himself, but he encourages young director. He encouraged uh, what's his name, Coppola. Really, Valencia. Francis Ford Coppola is a pupil of Roger Corman. Yeah, he was in Boston recently for the BFEF. Uh -huh. I wanted to go over and interview him, but we just. We get so bogged down, we can only do so much in a week. And I, I'm sure he'll be back because he's working with the Boston Film and Video Foundation. Uh -huh. So he was actually here recently. Oh, great. You see, when Corman did Dementia, he shot it in an Irish castle, he then turned over the crew and everything to Francis Ford Coppola. Really? Yeah. Oh, so he, it was really hands-on oh, endorsement. Yeah. It was, it was uh, you know, wow. stock succession, as it were. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he, he literally nursed this guy. Wow. Yeah. yeah he, and those things he did on Poe were okay. I mean, of course, what's you got, what do you have in a Poe story? You have the bare bones, you know. You don't have much, the black cat or murders in the room or 
So you have to improvise, you use your imagination. And, he, and I, I, in the, I think in his case, Pit and the Pendulum with Vincent Price, other one, he did a fine job of mm-hmm. taking the spirit of the story and forming a movie around it. Now, is there a web page for In Search of Dr. Yes, Jekyll? there is. And what is that? Oh, it's in there. Actually, okay. Someplace in the back. There's a great bibliography in here, too. In the bibliography. There's so much great stuff in here. Internet sites on page 281. There they are. There's one on the Jickies, you know, the the people who go to see, went, anyway, to see that musical. I mean, about the book itself. Is it? Do you have your own web page? But it's it's McNally at bc.edu. It's a very simple one. So and people can... I also can have a website, but I, I honestly, I forget, I didn't bring it with me, the, the exact title of it. But there's one website I have for my students, and then there's another one for general use. Ah. But I think they could find it just under my name. But there's hundreds of listings, which is great, under your name. <laughs> hundreds. Uh, yeah. and, well, let's go back to the book again. Uh, Brody, so when Stevenson... Yeah is growing up and he has the nanny, he has a piece of furniture correct. created by Brody. That's correct. That must have been... nursery. That's almost like a, uh, the spirit in the room. Yes. If you and will. That cabinet that Brody made still is there in the Writers' Museum in Edinburgh. Wow. My wife and I, when we went there, we saw it, took a photo of it. Wow. Yeah, it's still, it's still there. You have some great photos in the book your wife and you took. Yeah, she took a number of them. I took some. Uh, there's uh, a view. On location, too. Page 69, Carol McNally, another view of Stevenson's birthplace and home. Yeah. Uh, there are great photos in here. She did, uh, the most important shot she did was of the grave, Brody's grave. Brody's? Yeah, because it was locked. I mean, the Buckleu Cemetery, where he was buried, it was under lock and key with a huge, well, I thought, huge fence around it. So I wanted a picture of the tomb, of course, of Brody. So she she climbed the fence, <laughs> <laughs> and I stood watch to see if there were any policemen around or anything. And she climbed over there and got that shot, and she's credited there. An American law will not hold her responsible for. <laughs> uh, that that's now that was a question I had. Is there really a chance that Brody survived? There is a chance. But it's a far out chance. But he really had planned to stay oh, alive. He planned to cheat the executioner, definitely. When he was finally captured, by the way, in 1688, uh, we're the first ones, my wife and I, to go to Edinburgh, excuse me, to Amsterdam, where he was held prisoner. Mm-hmm. He tried to es- well, he did escape to Amsterdam. He was waiting for the next ship to take him to the United States. He wanted to go to North Carolina, a place like that. Unfortunately, he was apprehended there, and we found the prison cell where he was kept. Nobody had ever seen that before. And then they transported him back, and then there was a trial, and he was found guilty and then sentenced to hang. Now, (coughs) with the help of a surgeon, a French surgeon with a wonderful name, Pierre de Graves, (laughs) this Pierre de Graves, who claimed to be from the Paris uh, Polyclinic and all that, who knows, uh, said he had a way to cheat the help Brody cheat the execution. What he did is he made up a, a metal kind of brace that went underneath the shirt to cushion him or against the fall so it wouldn't break his neck. Then he had a tube inserted in his throat so that he wouldn't suffocate, him, get strangled to death. So he made the preparation. Then his guys, his minions, had made a deal whereby they'd grab his body after the so-called execution and they'd rush it down to Pierre de Graves, who'd use a landslide, you know, in those days, one of them, and try to revive the guy, which they did try, they did do, but unfortunately for him, he was hanged three times. Yo. First two times didn't work and they noticed it, you see. Wow. So he was hanged, and I think that did it, I'm almost sure. Although the legends persist that he got away with it and ended up, some say, in Paris and some say in North Carolina. But the grave was empty, correct? That is correct. So that adds to the mystery. 
So we know where he was buried. Uh, researchers uh, on this cemetery have indicated exactly the spot. Coffin, body, everything is missing. Coffin's missing too. Yes. So who knows what happened? Grave robbers? Anything's possible, you know, over the centuries. That's true too. Who knows? And one would think had he survived maybe on his deathbed he might want to send a note out or something. I don't think so because he had been trapped sending notes out like that. That's what got him into trouble. Ah. While he was on the lam, as we say, <laughs> fleeing from the police, he foolishly gave a bunch of letters to one of the people on board, including one back to his mistress. He had two mistresses in Edinburgh. And that did it. I mean, there was, you know, he used another name, but I mean, that was, they all knew, Dixon, he called himself. But I mean, everybody knew once they made the connection to his mistress that this was Brody, all right. That's crazy. It was. He, he was, he liked, you see, it's somewhat like Hyde in a way. He liked the thrill of getting away with something. Ah. He didn't do it for money, basically. Well, but being for fun. being hung over four pounds was it? Basically, yeah, it was peanuts. I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, but did they? Do you think they really executed him because they knew of all the other crimes? So this was like yeah. payback. They knew about the other stuff he had done, and they wanted, you know, this is Edinburgh, Calvinist Edinburgh. They wanted to set an example. Ah. And they were particularly upset because he came from the upper class. You see. So it was more than just the four pounds. Oh, and how? What they wanted to do was to say, look, here are these ordinary criminals. We understand why they steal. They're poor, whatever. But you, the judge addressed Brody, you come from a high station in life, an honorable profession. He was head of the Guild of Rights, W-R-I-G-H-T Carpenter. It was a big deal in Edinburgh. And you, you go ahead and do this stuff for what? You, you don't need the money. It's not poverty or something. Ah, you do it for the thrill of it. And of course, for someone who's a Calvinist type, that's terrible. Mm. You, you would steal just f for fun? <laughs> just to get away with it? Wow. But that's what he did. But Stevenson seems, Stevenson seems like such a, a nice, honest person. Uh, to have that double the surface. Well, I think Stevenson knew, knew personally about dub leading a double life, which he did do himself. Huh. So he, yeah, he liked to maintain, yeah, he was a hypocrite. He actually said one time, I answer to the name of Dr. Jekyll. Wow. So he admitted that he was a hypocrite like Jekyll who like to maintain, you know, the outside look of respectability, but inside was this subterranean dark side. And, yeah, Stevenson knew about that. Subterranean dark side. Yeah. It really makes it, uh, <laughs> hits home um, for people out there. Uh, it's scary. It, that's the stuff of horror movies. Yes. Definitely. I mean, you know, in this day and age with all the blood and guts and, uh, and you go on the you went to the theaters today, and even the new, I have to ask you, the new Anthony Hopkins Hannibal, which I think is one of the best movies I agree with I've you. seen. It is a great movie. That's correct. Don't you think the excessive gore takes away from what? Not for me, but I mean, there are worse ones, you know, like the slasher. I don't like the slasher movies myself. Because they're boring after a while. Some guy wields a knife and he's cuckoo. He's insane. What does that say to me? I'm not insane as far as I know. I can't identify with this guy. But I can identify with Anthony Hopkins playing Hannibal. He's a smart guy. He knows history. I mean, he knows it very, very well, actually. And he has this quirky... Look, it's like this. It's going to sound strange, but... We all have, in order to go on living, we all have to eat mm -hmm. and we all have to drink, right? Correct. And breathe. There's no way around that. You have to eat and you have to drink to go on living. 
Now the question then becomes only what do you drink and what do you eat? Huh. And you know, vampires do the human blood routine, high protein diet, and this guy eats humans. I'm thinking of having your wife for dinner <laughs> with fava beans and some chianti. <laughs> he, you, you know, in the film, he reminds me of Dracula going through the darkened streets. You know what he reminds me of, of course, because I've just been... He reminds me of Dr. Chico and Mr. Hyde. You're absolutely right. He has that suave, continental side. He's well-educated. He's under control when he's, you know, Dr. Fell and all that at the uh, museum. And then suddenly, he becomes a raging animal. I mean, a beast. I mean, he goes for somebody. He's a, he's, he's a beast. But like this book, it's retribution. He does it to the people who deserve. Yes. yes. He's an anti-hero. Yes, he does. He, I mean, you, he doesn't go really after the. Why I like him, you know, or I think most people do. I mean, let's take the first movie. To, I mean, you're glad when he goes for that insipid guy who is. Sure. Nice. Sure. You know, you say, hey, go right. I'm having a friend over for dinner, you know. Great, one of the great movie lines. <laughs> yeah. So, and then, yeah, and then the other ones, I mean, he goes for this Patsy guy who's out for the money and who's not even doing his job. He should be reporting this right. to the authorities. He's not because he wants that lousy reward. Mm -hmm. So he becomes greedy. And the old G lawyer gets greedy, him. Greedy, you got to be punished. And that's what happened to the Patsy relative way, way back in the Renaissance period. And that's what's going to happen to this fellow. He got greedy. The whole thing about the film, uh, do you mention it in here? About what? Uh, Hannibal? Uh, no, no, I don't mention Hannibal. Hannibal, when I did this, wasn't even out yet. Uh, the film opens with that wonderful FBI kind of scene. Yeah. So different from the rest of the movie, and, and then the scenery, everything is just... Oh, it's beautiful. That's Scott Ridley, you know, the director. He's very, very good. I was shocked to see Dino De Laurentiis involved. Yeah. Well, because I think of King Kong. Yes. And, you know... Well, he gets involved, you know, between you and me and anything. He thinks going to make money, let's face it. That's what I think. Right, but to see such a classy film. Very classy. Especially the Florence shots. Exquisite. Really? And moody, too, the dark shooting, you know. I thought that was very well done in that sequence, uh, in Florence especially. And then it's Gary Oldman, as you know, who's not credited because he, he wanted to be credited, you know, along with Anthony Hopkins as one of the stars. Uh -huh. And they wouldn't. So he said, okay, don't credit me at all. Fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a, I, I agree with you. That's a fine movie. Just this movie, plain old movie. And the portrayal is great. And I, I, I like Julianne Moore, Julianna Moore. She's not a, not, she's no, you know, she's not the same as, uh, what's her name? Jodie Foster. Jodie Foster. But I think Jodie would have hurt the movie. Ah, why do you think that? I she's that. such a big star. Uh-huh. I think it would have been the sequel, where it's not the sequel now. It, it really is Anthony Hopkins' film. As this, it almost makes Silence of the Limbs the prequel. Uh, in my I, mind, you know, there were some people, many people actually, and they got into the review saying, "Well, it's no Silence of the Limbs." Well, of course, it's no Silence of the Limbs, right, Joe? I mean, what do you want to do? See Silence of the Limbs again, number two? No, I get it. It's a different movie. I agree with you. It's a different movie, and it works. If you go in there thinking you're going to see Silence of the Lamb redone, of course you're going to be disappointed. But you shouldn't go in there thinking. I mean, why make a movie unless you make a new one, something different? And I think they did with that one. They really did. And the history is incredibly correct, you know. I mean, unbelievable, all about those Renaissance types, you know. Unbelievable, the amount of research that went into that by that. Thomas Harris, is that the guy? Uh, yeah, right. It escapes me. Yeah, uh, I think it is Thomas Harris. I went back and read Red Dragon. So they made into a movie called Manhunt, and they're thinking of doing one now. I like that movie. Manhunt, yeah. Uh, it's a made-for-TV movie. Yeah, it's a, it didn't do much, though. No, but after Silence of the Limbs, they did replay it a bit, and um, yeah. it's got that great scene with uh, Iron Butterfly in a guy with the Vita and mm -hmm. 
the window. Do you, have you seen the film? No, I oh. haven't seen Manhunt. It's got a great scene in it, and for a made-for-TV movie, it's uh. it, it is not. It's totally separate from Silence of the Lambs and, and Hannibal. Uh. But no, they're going to. I understand they're going to do Red Dragon, which is a great story too, right. by the way, about the apocalypse, basically revelations and all that. It's, it's interesting how the TV movie does the uh, the quickie version, if you will, and then Hollywood gets hip to it. Yeah. Because of... But you've done all the work for Hollywood here. Yeah. Well, most great horror movies, as you well know, Joe, are based on a work of literature, with few exceptions. Mm -hmm. There are some, but not many. You think of all the classic ones, almost invariably, you know, whether it's Frankenstein, Dracula, or whatever. Hunchback of Notre Dame. It goes back to some piece of literature. And I think, well, this is... Now, this is all stuff that's been reported. Now, how much of it is true? Al Pacino supposedly is interested in starring in a new version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Wow. Screenplay by West Newton resident David Mamet. That could be good. That could, if it happens, you know. As you well know, there are a lot of movies they talk about right. that never happen, never get made. But I think you could make one now for the first time, first time, based on the novel. Every other Jekyll and Hyde movie has been based on the theatrical version by this guy, Thomas Russell Sullivan, or variations of that. This time around, maybe they'd go back to the novel. I know they always say that at the beginning of the movie, say, based on the novel by Robert Lund, but it isn't. Did you like the recent Dracula movies? Um, that Which, the, the, um, well, after Wes Craven's Dracula? And that no, one? before that, there was, um, I went and saw the play back in, oh, 78. Oh, the Frank Langella one? Yes, okay. I, saw, yeah. I saw that one too here in Boston. Right. I liked the play, because he did it for laughs, with the sets by the late wonderful guy. That play was, was great. Dramas, by the way, Edward Gorey, you know, a great artist, did this. I like that play. But when they made the movie, what did they do? They didn't play it for laughs anymore. They played it as serious. I'm sorry. Yeah. You can't do that with Dracula today. The minute you guy says, I don't drink wine, you know, no matter how he says it, everyone's going to think, oh, yeah, sure. It's corny. Right. I, mean, I wanted to hear your opinion. That's that's Very corny. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't work anymore. You have to do something inventive with it. You, and there have been attempts, but nobody's ever really succeeded. You know, something like Young Frankenstein, mm -hmm. which was a, very well done. Well, there was one called Old Dracula with David Niven, but it was a dog. It was a bad movie. But, you know, Love at First Bite was neat, with uh, George Hamilton playing Dracula for fun. How about the Anne Rice and the Tom Cruise as a vampire, I mean. Yeah, I didn't like Tom Cruise. I mean, he's a nice-looking guy and all that, but I still agree with her initial view. And he's miscast. Totally. Afterwards, she changed around, I think, between you and me, because David Geffen got really upset and said, we paid all this money to her, and now she complains. <laughs> so then she shifted around and said, no, it wasn't, it was okay. It wasn't okay. No. And that could have been such a... Uh oh, it could have been. You see, for me, in a horror movie, I have to be frightened a little bit under controlled condition. I have to be scared. Mm -hmm. If the character doesn't scare me, it's not a horror, great horror movie. It's bottom line for me. Nosferatu, in my opinion, is still the best Dracula movie ever made. Really? Not 1922 Nosferatu. Sure. Because there the vampire is really scary looking. You know, Max Schreck. Oh, he, horrifying. Boy, he really, and that's authentic. By that I mean, it's the way vampires are supposed to look, according to Transylvanian folklore, after they've been in the grave for weeks or months or whatever. They're not the suave continental type with the tuxedo and everything. By the way, do you know where that came from? It's from the theater. What happened was, first theatrical adaptation by Hamilton Dean. They said, how are we going to cut down on wardrobe costs? This is true. It's going to sound weird. Whoa. Tuxedo. Because the actor can wear it on stage and then at the dinner party after. So we save on wardrobe costs. 
and the stand-up collar, that came from how do you make the guy disappear on stage or seem to with the stand-up collar, he turns his back to the audience. He has two pieces of sticks that hold up the stand-up collar. Sure. You can't see him. Then the trap door opens underneath. He descends down quickly, brings the sticks with him, and it looks as if he's disappeared. But that's great stuff, too. It's great In stuff, a way. but I mean, that becomes right. then the icon, you know. Everybody, almost everybody who plays has got to dress up in a tuxedo after that. With a, with a cape and a stand-up collar. And in fact, George Hamilton, in the best sense, makes fun of that by saying, how would you like to be dressed? Oh, no. How would you like to be forced to be dressed like a head waiter all your life? <laughs> uh, it's a good point. It's how a great point. Like to wear a tux every day. <laughs> and a cape, even in the hot weather. <laughs> but that's the, that, that becomes the, foolishly, in my opinion, it comes from a theatrical, you know, need, which is no longer there. I mean, we don't need this stuff anymore, but still the guys appear in the tuxedo and kind of color. As you know, in the novel, he did not wear a tuxedo ever. He's all black from head to toe. There's not a speck of color on him, Dracula. No color. He's uh, no cape, no tux. Prince of Darkness. Yeah, he's just dark. He's, he's simple sort of dress. I mean, costume. Oh, man, someone could just do something with it still today. Oh, they could. The, Dracula, the great Dracula movie, weirdly enough, after at least 400 of them, has never been made. It sounds weird, I know, but it is true. But you're the guy. You really are the guy. Our guest today is Raymond T. McNally, professor at Boston College. And uh, it's an honor to have you here. Oh, again. it's fun to be here again, Joe, and I appreciate your interest, which goes way, way, way back. Way back. 30 years almost, maybe, maybe more, I don't well, know. I'm going to be 47, and I've been doing this since I was like 14, 15, publishing the magazine, you know, yeah. and here we are today. Wow. Um, but I, I was thrilled to see in the Globe that, you know, you were doing a, a speech on this at one of the bookstores. Yeah. And that's why I rang up Renaissance, and here we are oh, again. Yeah, I'm going to be at the Newtonville bookstore soon, actually. I, haven't get, I, I had a date, but oh, I wow. canceled it, but I'm going to do that and a couple of other places. I'll be I'll be at Mer Mermaids in Hull. My daughter has a shop there. Wow. <laughs> June 1st. June 1st. Just after uh, Memorial Day, or what a day is it? One of those days, one of those holidays. Our show's going to be back on down in the Cape area, so. Oh, great. We're, we're doing a big outreach, because. Oh, June 1, that'll be the time. Five to seven, I'll do a book signing, give a little talk. Oh, and wow. yeah, my daughter runs a shop there called the Mermaids, right on Hull, right on Revere Beach. Yeah. Oh, good, because we're going to be on the Adelphi system down there in Plymouth really? and Cape Cod, so we'll make sure this Great. tape goes out. Yeah. And uh, that'll be good. Hi to everyone down there, and uh, <laughs> our, our hour is zipped right by. Yeah. Um, right. But you know, you're always welcome here at Visual oh, Radio. Thanks, Joe. And uh, thanks so much for oh, good joining you. us today. And we'll be back with another show real soon.